Okay. We are recording. Good nice evening. Day. Good evening. It is March 12th, 2024. This is the regular meeting of the CRC. It's now 631. I'm calling the meeting to order. I have a quorum here present, and I'm sure everyone else will, will find their way in very shortly. I'm going to go around just by the order of what I see on the screen and ask if you can hear us and see if we can hear you. So, Councillor Haneke. Present. Patricia DeAngelis. Present. Councillor Ette. Present. Cam Rooney is present. And um, we'll check in with Dave Zomek and Rob Mora in a couple minutes. Um, we have no public hearings tonight, and we let's see if we have anyone in the audience. We do have a couple of people in the audience, and so the next item on the agenda is general public comment, and this would be public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC, and re residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes based on the number of people, so three minutes would be lovely. And the CRC, unfortunately, does not engage in a dialogue or comment back and forth on a matter raised during public comment. There may be an opportunity to speak again after our action items, um, and we'll keep an eye on hands for that. Uh, so I'm opening up the floor to um, anyone in the audience who would like to speak. You're welcome to do so now. Please raise your hand, and we'll let you in. I'm not seeing any hands ra being raised. Um, again, maybe we'll have some opportunity later in the meeting to, to talk about the action items tonight. So let's move to action items. And um, I'm actually looking for Jennifer Taub, who's gonna do a short update. On, there she is, hmm. short update on the ZBA vacancies and just sort of the status of that. Jennifer, can you hear us? Yes, I'm sorry, I was having trouble connecting. Um, okay, ZBA update. We are the the only time the committee could make it of my first uh, uh, meeting form was our regularly scheduled meeting on March 26. So I polled the applicants and all but one could attend. So then I tried for our next regularly scheduled meeting on April 9th and all the applicants could attend except for one, a different one. So one applicant is going away the second week in April and one is away this third and fourth weeks in March. So I sent out a new poll to everyone yesterday, applicants and CRC members, hoping that either we can do Friday, March 29th or the next week, which is of April 1st. I've heard from five people and we do have a date in common for those five. So I would just ask if you could all respond as soon as you can. And then I will, if I don't hear by tomorrow from the uh, applicants and haven't responded, I'll contact them each individually. So it looks like it will hopefully be sometime the first week in April, but it, it's, there's 12 of us. One of the applicants I should say for the ZBA has withdrawn. Um, I think she's pursuing another a couple of committees. So there's 12 of us we're trying to schedule and it's feeling like trying to schedule the council retreat, but we'll get there. Is there any possibility we could schedule um, two nights where we had six of the applicants and the other six on another evening, if that would help? The problem is if together, we debrief together. and then not debrief until after the after second. After the second one, yeah. I don't know. I mean, that might. Yeah. So make... let's see if we can get this because again, we have this thing with different. Yeah. 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 But we might have to do that, but hopefully not. And then Thank I you. hope yeah, we that's, avoid that's... this when we start rescheduling for the planning board vacancies. Yeah. That's another topic, <laughs> um, but coming, coming soon. Um, I want to, let's see. So, Again, once once the dates are established, the request for their statements of interest will get will get put out so that we get their 
statements of interest uh, approximately 10 days before the interview date. So it gives us time to post them and make them the public documents that they that they are. Um, thank you, Jennifer. I know that's a task and I was very glad that you offered to, to, to do it. <laughs> it's just housekeeping. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You do I'm here, work. I'm here. And I could hear you the whole time. <laughs> okay, everybody settled. We're all we're all here. Okay. Um, let's go to Rob Moore. I see him in the audience, uh, and I hope you all had a chance to read what he presented. It went in our packet. It also got posted on the website, and it is a summary of the implementation. Hi, Rob. Uh, that I think Dave, you, and Rob. Uh, helped put together, correct? Yeah, thanks, Pam. It, it, it was mostly Rob, but yes, we have discussed it over the last couple of days and also uh, talked some with uh, Paul Bachman about it. Good. Good. Rob, do you want to, how would you like to present this? Because it looks like there is some opportunity for or some suggestions of word changes, and we'll have to um sort of reopen our documents if that's the case yes um that's that's right do you want me to um just kind of skip the first section and go right to the more of the implementation to and, and go over that first then we can go back to a couple of changes in the bylaw or it's up to you um actually it would be it'd be helpful to talk about the implementation itself and then maybe come back and and structure the the wording if, if there are word changes. Okay, so then this is mostly the second page of the um, the memo and the schedule of implementation. And this is based on uh, the council taking action, you know, by May 1st, basically, is, you know, how I kind of laid this out. Um, <clears throat> expecting that if, if you do move this along to the, the council, council in April, um, you know, taking into account the 14 days uh, waiting after the, the decision uh, around May 1st is one way we would be in a position to, to start doing something. Uh, so in the schedule of implementation following the adoption uh, of the bylaw, uh, May 1st through September 1st of this year would be uh, the ideal time period to bring on one of the two inspector hires that'll be needed for this program and our uh, management or program assistant to support the program. So these are, these would be the first two positions, you know, dedicated solely to, um, you know, anything related to building the inspection program. Uh, by July 1st, uh, we'll- Just a moment, hold on, excuse me. Mandy, can you pull up um, Rob's memo? That'll be, that'll be, I think, easier for us to follow. Thank you. Okay, and um, as a reminder, uh, as far as staff needed for this program, we have uh, our lead inspector currently on staff. Uh, that's Ed Smith, took over John Thompson's position. And this program as it's designed now will require two additional inspectors and one uh, administrative assistant. Uh, but at that early stage, uh, I'm not proposing that we need to hire uh, both inspectors, just one and the program assistant uh this year and then uh that will get us prepared for july 1st uh revision of the fee schedule in the program so that uh all the renewals that happen this year on july 1st are according to the uh proposed fee schedule that uh, you have worked on um the following year uh six months i'm sorry january uh, july 1st through january 1st is uh, my estimate on what it's gonna take to really build out the system that we need, our electronic system, uh, building out uh, the OpenGov module for uh, being able to handle inspections, developing the inspection checklists, uh, planning how we're going to um, you know, make the selection of properties and units to be inspected over the five-year period. Uh, 
probably a lot of outreach and notifications uh, to go out to property owners, uh, giving advance notice of the inspection program and changes to the bylaw. Uh, but by, July, by January 1st of 25, that's when I'm hoping we're gonna be ready to start phasing into the inspection program. So uh, as you can see here, the, you know, the first year is, um, is, is really phasing this in. Uh, so you, you can think of the five-year cycle as really being a six-year cycle uh, in the initial round. Uh, so that first year gets us uh, start to, to build the staff, build the system, and start conducting inspections and kind of work out any of the issues that we need to uh, during that time frame. So that when we get to uh, July of 25, we're really ready to complete that first one fifth of the inspections needed uh, to, to start off that, formally start off that five year cycle. So it isn't until March of 25 through July of 25 where we'll be ready uh, and need that second inspector. Uh, that's really as we're getting uh, getting scheduled and notices out for a large number of, of inspections um, to, to meet that approximately 500 per year, uh, according to uh, the numbers that Mandy put together on the fee schedule. So July 1st, 25 to July 1st, 26 is the first year. That's the first, um, you know, about 500 inspections completed in the first of the five-year cycle. Uh, and then just to <clears throat> be clear, and as I note above in some of the language we'll talk about after is that, um, you know, that takes us through 2030 to complete the five-year uh, initial uh, inspection cycle. Probably go into any questions for that section before talking about costs, if you like. Yep. Any questions for Rob? I have I have one if no one else does. Um, in in looking at your first year, I had sort of noted that it looked like you had a year of leg room, and that's exactly or elbow room. That's exactly what you described. Um, so you have currently there's a lead inspector, uh, and you also have some administrative assistance. Is is it expected that that person would end up? Um, and you're able to you're able to track and manage, you know, various inspections and and different program and the rental program currently with that person. Um, the duties would be uh, in addition to what that person is currently doing. Question mark. And um, and 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 yeah, I think that's basically my question. So let me talk about the, I think the two staff people you're referring to is our, our lead our lead code enforcement officer, Ed Smith. Um, what we want to make sure doesn't happen is that we lose what's being done currently. So, um, you know, Ed is, as John was, extremely busy and cannot take on more work. Ultimately, the lead inspector will will be just that the lead role to the you know the the provide guidance to the other inspectors. Uh, probably have a more of a presence in the office to to deal with um, people that walk in to the counter or phone calls that come in that require you know immediate attention by an inspector, and and that will continue. So we don't want to lose you know the complaint response that occurs now. And that is the bulk of that position. Uh, and we we don't have a dedicated administrative assistant to the program. We share uh, staff in the office for all the functions, including uh, planning uh, work that goes on. And um, the the person that probably does the most with licensing and permitting is Steve McCarthy, who is our uh, licensing coordinator, and he handles the the kind of he takes the lead on the renewal process, notification, reminders, and tracking kind of our numbers. You know who who's outstanding and and have uh, permit renewal due, 
And then, you know, as available, uh, one of our other administrative assistants or management assistants will help out with the kind of the processing of the application itself and issuing the permit. So that can all continue. Um, and, and wherever possible, we're going to have to find a little bit of time here and there to really get this started. But I am proposing that we hire an inspector and a program assistant dedicated to this program as early as May. You know, that's probably best case scenario, but, you know, hiring isn't easy right now for, for jobs. Uh, so I'm expecting it could take a little bit longer, but in a perfect scenario, we would have people on staff in the next couple of months um, following the adoption of the bylaw. Um, we have the funding for that, so we could talk about that later uh, within both our current budget and, and moving into future budgets. Uh, we're, we'll prepare for that, and we've had those discussions with the town manager already. Um, so yeah, I think you know there's a little bit of room for you know inconsistent kind of helping out between all staff as we always do, but um, you know really no room for anybody to take on a whole new program and regular, um, you know, uh, work, work, um, or tasks, uh, 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 for this program. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Haneke. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, when you were talking about the program assistant and the, um, building out of the electronic inspection program, a uh, question popped into my head, which was right now the connection between uh, failed inspections or police calls and all that used to show up on GIS and other systems is broken or doesn't work because of out the, the back end no longer talking to each other. Is is this build out of and develop the electronic inspection program also going to include that sort of public reporting of inspection failures uh, calls? Maybe not the dispatch log calls, but the inspection side calls and the rental permit things similar to what used to be findable on GIS? Yes, that, that's a must. Uh, going forward, what I can't commit to is replacing everything else that that used to do. So we used to be able to get zoning permits and building permits and, uh, you know, it's, it's a big loss. And, you know, we know that IT knows that they will develop a solution to that in time, uh, but as we build out this component, uh, all of those documents will be uh, readily accessible. If you happen to have used OpenGov at all for anything that we are, um, you know, using it for now, building permits, um, food licenses, uh, alcohol licenses, you would see that that is all available. So um, it would be even better than that because we're looking at uh, we we're using Burlington, Vermont as a as a good model uh, for some pieces of what we want to do with some mapping uh, modules that are available through OpenGov to show where things are happening. And then, uh, of course, getting inspection uh, reports and checklists and results uh, posted there. Uh, and, and those things that are done now with building inspectors are uh, electrical plumbing inspectors and health inspectors are all using it electronically in the field with iPads. It's all immediate. So, you know, when there's a decision made, it's it's updated uh, really quickly and, and available to the public. Can I ask a follow-up? Yep. So is that system, I know if I want to look up a property card for, for my house or anyone else's house in the GIS system, I don't have to log in with a username or a password is, you know, but when I went to open gov to try and find, I think at one point, Rob, you forwarded me to the rental application program to see what people signed on the application. I, I think I had to log in and create a username and password or something. Will everything you just talked about, um, is it now available without an actual login or are to, in order to see all that, do people have to have their own logins? The login gets you access to more information. So, you know, there are, there are pieces, depending on which program it is, there are pieces that can be seen um, just by clicking on the, the permit type and seeing the address and that there's a permit in, 
open or active. Uh, the login gets you uh, more detailed into the attachments and uh, seeing some of the discussion that is happening between uh, either inspectors or applicant and inspector. So both, um, and it, I think we'll, uh, have, we haven't had these discussions with IT yet, uh, but we'll have to decide what can be done with this, uh, this part of that program once we learn how to use it. So we don't use this type of program for anything else yet. Uh, you know, this has the ability, it has the ability to do everything from um, inspection, checklist, permitting, ticketing, it can do it all. Uh, I think Cambridge and Brookline are using it and our IT department has been in touch with them. So we'll, that's, that's what that six months will figure out um, how that gets done. But our goal is to make it as, uh, my goal is to uh, hopefully make it as easy as possible to get access to that information um, like it once was through the mapping system, which was really easy to get to. Thank you. Any other questions for Rob? You want to talk a little bit about expenses and and the cost of the program? Yes. Uh, so a reminder, uh, and, and you have all seen these numbers or close to these numbers. The full program expense is uh, four hundred seventy-seven thousand five hundred eighty dollars, um, and that the breakdown is uh, right below that with the two lead, uh, the lead inspector, the two. Uh, new inspectors, the program assistant, vehicle allowance for those inspectors uh, within this program, uh, an estimated legal budget, and then just a small advertising, uh, which is an account we have already, but adding $500 to that account. That's uh, why it's called printing and advertising, um, because that's the way it's listed in our budget now. Uh, so that, that total uh, is supported uh, in part by the expected revenue that um, Mandy put together, the four hundred and six thousand dollars, based on the, um, the the concept for the fee schedule that was last uh, reviewed and adopted or recommended by the CRC. And as you can see, there's a remaining uh, uh, there's remaining funds needed to to uh, cover all the expenses, and that's where we'll use part of the strategic partnership money, which is uh, $100,000. And I, that's a five-year commitment that we have now. And we're into it one year already. Uh, so that's at least for the next uh, four, three or four continue, you know, years from, from now. Um, the next section is, you know, kind of the costs. And, and this was more for our discussion with the finance team, the costs that might start immediately and going forward in the first year, building up to that full program. And that's the breakdown for the initial program expenses is, uh, you know, for our best case scenario um, of having inspector, an inspector and an admin hired uh, for the last couple of months of this year, uh, that's the $32,000, uh, some general expenses to get uh, things rolling and building the program. Uh, and that's, that's funded out of um, surplus money in our account right now and our budget right now because uh, we've had a vacancy uh, salary position for nine months, uh, which uh, more than covers these costs. Um, and that's salary plus a benefit package uh, when, when we're using any of these estimated figures. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the lead inspector doesn't earn $112,000, but that includes the, the benefit package uh, that goes along with any full-time position. Uh, the second uh, group of figures uh, is, is what I would expect when we're operating in a full, the first full year with uh, that new staff person, uh, two staff people uh, leading into the, uh, the first full year uh, of the program. Uh, and then, you know, again, we're building ourselves up to that full program. Uh, during that first year, um, anticipating we'll be able to conduct 100 inspections, and that's reflected in the, uh, the revenues that will be collected, uh, both by the permit fee in the new schedule and those, uh, that small number of inspections that we'll uh, likely be able to conduct in the first, first year. Uh, so that's the $347,000 total. 
revenue collection. Any questions for Rob? Pam, I see your hand up. Um, I had a question about the technology that you mentioned, and I wondered in the budget estimate breakdown if there needs to be a technology budget. I know that software software programs are unfortunately expensive, and the and the renewals of them is expensive. Are we going to be adding um, to the technology cost? And then the second question is general expenses. I think are sort of those shared overhead, everybody pitches in to cover cost of sort of, um, maybe you could explain a little bit what the general expenses are. Um, that's it for now. Yeah, so at this point, we're not expecting to have to purchase any new technology. <clears throat> uh, we, we've made our purchase to OpenGov. Um, we have uh, it available to us it really comes down to a lot of time. It's, it's time for IT staff to uh, build it to a certain point, and then it's time for our own staff to take it from there. So uh, we've been through this with uh, the building permit modules, the licensing, and <clears throat> it's months and months of work for our staff. And it has to be staff that understands what the program is going to be and what, you know, what that checklist is gonna look for, what the code, reference might be. Uh, so at this point, we're, we're not in anticipating uh, any big purchases, just have to dedicate the time for it. Um, the general expenses, uh, you know, we're, I'm hoping to do some little bit of advertising and outreach uh, as soon as we know that we're moving forward with this. The bulk of general expenses is usually auto allowances and equipment purchases. Uh, so if there's, you know, tape measures, rulers, uh, cameras, cell phones, you know, things that need to be purchased, uh, that that's what I'm capturing in general expenses. And for the purposes of the initial couple months of the program, that was just a, a really rough number just to get a figure in there for our finance team to understand that there could, we need to have some some money available uh, from our from our surplus and. And this was important, you know, for us as we come to the end of a fiscal year. What what I'm what I need to do is estimate the amount of money that I need to kind of reserve for expenses that we're anticipating. And that's you know that's what these numbers do for the finance team, so that they know um, how much is actual surplus that they can count on for other purposes for the town, and how much we want to reserve for ourselves. Jennifer. Um, Rob, will you be a, you'll be able to come to the council meeting and give the same presentation? Um, because I sometimes think we've we've completed this, but we do have to kind of sell it to the council. And you've done a very good job of of explaining it here. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, and I'd, I'd expect that I would be invited when this is being discussed. David. Yeah, that might be an interesting segue. I'm not sure if if the group is ready to to discuss kind of where we go from here. But you know, again, uh, all the credit in the world to Rob for for diving into this uh, you know headfirst with you all and and putting this on paper. As he referenced a couple of times, we've had conversations with with you know weeks and weeks ago with the finance committee but but this proposal has been honed in recent weeks with Paul and with his finance team and so we've had some pretty recent conversations about your process as it relates um as councilor Tobb just mentioned to the the full council considering this but also how do we how do we dovetail that with Paul's budget process that um, is going on right now. So um, maybe I'll pause there. <laughs> um, certainly, um, you know, Rob has been in, involved in all of those conversations, but um, 
I know there was discussion of bringing this, I believe there was discussion of bringing this to the council in early April. I'm not sure, you know, if those dates have been talked about or, or discussed the first reading in early April, but obviously the sooner the better so that this can, as I said, kind of dovetail with Paul's process of, of presenting a budget to you all. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mandy, Councilor Hennigan. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I can I can jump in on that one and and take Dave's lead um, and, um, with my thoughts. I I think uh, Rob's plan is well thought out, um, and he's found the places in the bylaw and regs where we'd need to adjust because it's essentially, as he said, become a six year plan instead of a five. And when we were talking about it, we were talking about a five-year plan. Um, uh, I, I, I would love to see this. I don't know whether it needs to be have a first reading or both a second reading yet. That That's for other people to decide. We technically already had a first reading of all of this. So maybe we go into a second, but maybe it's, since it's a different council, it's good to have both a first and a second. I'd love to see it on Monday's agenda if we can be done tonight um, for at least a first read and April 1 for a vote personally. Um, I think the sooner we can get it on the agenda to talk about the better um, because it gives Rob more time. I think our April meetings are April 1 and 15. No, April 1 and 8. Yeah. One and eight. And so, I mean, we could do the one and eight too, but, but I wouldn't want to put it past those times that's potentially two readings two agenda items in two of the next three meetings um and i think it's doable and i would i would ask our chair assuming we finish the changes that that rob had done and revote recommendations today i'd ask the chair to urge our president to get it on two of those three or one of those three depending on whether they deem we need two readings or one um so, so that we can we can act and and give some certainty to our inspections department because I think that's sometimes it's harder to have the uncertainty than to know one way or the other. Yep, thank you, Jennifer. You're muted. I'm sorry. If I'm looking at my calendar correctly, do we really not have a council meeting between April eighth and May sixth? Yeah, so we really do want it sooner <laughs> yeah so we really do need to look at april 8th i think for the second reading so i will i will be sitting in on the uh scheduling meeting uh tomorrow and if not tomorrow well tomorrow and possibly return on the 20th but i think um that i can go with a very strong message that that this is preferable especially if we have any desire of getting it implemented by the um, the cutoff date for uh, the renewal of of um, permits and the implementation of the fee that was proposed by finance committee and then finally again by us. So that would that gives me a very clear message to, to deliver. Are there any, before we go to the wording, and, and again, as Mandy said, um, the adjustments and wording are as a result of, of trying of scheduling and, and structuring the implementation. Are there any other general thoughts on what Rob has presented so far? Jennifer. No, it's just, it's really great to see it after all these years, like it's implementable. <laughs> So thank you. <laughs> I feel like it's come a long way since our last meeting as we actually see that it can happen in this budget. So fingers crossed for the council. Dave. Oh, I appreciate that you will be sitting in on agenda setting tomorrow you, you referenced. So that's good. I may not make that meeting. So I appreciate that you'll be there and and again, I think 
as soon as possible. And I'm sure, you know, Paul has been briefed on this. He's well aware, but but I just wanted to reemphasize that point about, um, you know, dovetailing with the budget development process. Did I miss anything? I'm just going to ask Rob, is there anything that I might have missed specific to that meshing of of this proposal, the council's timing, and um, and Paul's budget development that we were going to raise tonight. No, I th I think we've covered it, and the Paul and his team has been given our figures. You know whether or not you know they're just kind of held in the background until the council makes their decision. Um, but they they know uh, they they know exactly what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. So. Um, on that note, then, there seems to be general consensus, or at least no one's speaking up, that they don't like this proposal. They don't feel comfortable with the implementation plan. I'm going to take that as a consensus that everybody can support this and speak positively for the council to the council as we bring it forward. Um, I will, when we get this scheduled on the on the council agenda, I will absolutely make sure that that Rob is invited and Dave is invited to be able to be there for a resource. And at some point we would need to sit down and talk about what we want to present in terms of just an overall because I think I think it deserves being so complex. It deserves some sort of presentation. So I will be looking for suggestions on that as well in the next few days, week. Um, all that said, shall we go back to the suggested word changes? And um, I'm going to look at Mandy to say, or sort of lead us in um, reopening our document since we voted to approve it on the 27th. Um, I guess I would I would ask for a motion to consider modification to this document. Does that make sense? I think we just vote yet another recommendation. <laughs> Our update, instead of like reopening the recommendation, because I mean, last one was after prior recommendation on a prior version. Um, so. <clears throat> Sounds good. The, uh, right now the, the document we voted last meeting is what is up the revision from february 27th um in this document rob is suggesting i believe correct me if i'm wrong rob the only change being delete that section and and that is a deletion but essentially a deletion from the bylaw and an insertion of a slightly different wording into the regulations so it's not a complete get rid of it it's move a slightly different wording to the regulations but i'm sure rob can explain it more yeah rob would you like to yes um so that's exactly right so i didn't think that was necessary if we uh work on a addition to the regulations but if you um so that's the piece that would be deleted. And if you go back to um, I1A uh, at the beginning of the inspections section and the last sentence there in that first paragraph, <clears throat> um, what I saw there was that um, the last the last phrase there and provisions for phasing in the inspection requirement upon adoption of the bylaw. So we already kind of set up for doing what um, I am proposing to do in the regulations. So that language was already in there. So I think with that, uh, we're expecting to see something in the regulations and we don't need to have that um, IC any longer uh, if we deal with it in the regulations, which we do for the regular five-year inspection cycle. So let's just get some language in there to deal with that initial round following the adoption. Rob, I was going to ask on this 5C, once the program is, is implemented, in order for the bylaw to stand on its own again, I guess we've adjusted the regulations, is this, is this phrase going to be necessary again 
it just says shall undergo within five days of the effective date. So it sounds like that's already, we will have already kicked that off. We will already have passed that point. Right. So once, you know, even with this language, once we get past the five years, it really doesn't serve any purpose. Um, and we don't want to commit to the five years, as you saw in the schedule implementation schedule. Um, so just like the language that I'm proposing for the regulations will have no effect after the first six years. Uh, and it will, uh, you will defer to the routine inspection schedule in the regulations at five years, unless it's changed in the future to another, uh, another time frame. Anyone want to, uh, any other comments? So I, I support removing it from here. I do too. Um, shall we, shall we make a motion to remove that, that item, which is, which is. I see. I see. Thank you. I lost my place. Oh wait, right. I one C. No, I, yeah, I one C. Correct. Let's go through all of them and then we can vote on it. Um, well, I think this is the only one in this by in the bylaws. In the reg in the regulation. You want me to pull up the regulations? Hold on, hold on. I'm 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 I just confused myself. Yeah, we are do we're we're in the general bylaw right now. Yeah. Okay. Anyone want to make a motion to accept this change? So I'll I'll make a motion to. I guess revise our recommendation to include the deletion of section I1C of the general bylaws of the proposed general bylaw. Uh, I'll second. Let's take a vote. Any other comments before we vote? Okay, Councillor Ette. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Patricia DeAngelis. Aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Pam Rooney is an aye, so that is unanimous. Um, deletion of I 1C. Now we go to the regulations. Give me a second. I apparently didn't have that one open. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, regulations. So section B1, B2. And Rob is proposing deleting the highlighted highlighted phrase. And it actually reflects more closely the the previous um, phrase, which is on a frequency deemed necessary by the principal code official. This too would be deemed necessary by the principal code official. I think it makes sense personally um, for your, your reason of it matches the other one, but it gives Rob even more discretion. Um, and Rob's department more discretion than, but not less than annually required an annual or more than annually. And this one says, well, you know, maybe it needs to be 18 months or two years. We're not so concerned that it's 12 months. So I think it, it allows the department to tailor the inspection based on the concerns that the nuisance property violations were causing. I'd like to add that I think this is the 
this is probably the one remaining phrase that attempts to link nuisance activity, nuisance behavior, and violation to any kind of um, not threat, but just reason, reason and rationale for potential denial of a permit that um, if, if we have not linked it completely to a violation, de declining a permit can no longer be linked directly to the number of violations. And so this phrase here, B12, C1, B2, um, was one of the few tools that was left to say, because this is a nuisance property, because it's, and that, and a nuisance property is only when it's consistently and, 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 and excessively nuisance, that um, they also are penalized because by having additional inspections. And it was the cost of the inspections that um, was the, the, the penalty, I guess you could say. So I'm I'm okay with with removing that phrase um, if we feel we can accomplish the same thing without it. Rob. So, you know, when I was rereading the bylaw uh, in the regulations, you know this. I think the reason why I suggested this is because just what you said, it was the last remaining piece. And I did listen to the discussion the CRC had with Chief Ting last time and the decision that was made to um, not have that, that really solid connection between permit issuance, uh, hanging on to your, per your, your permit uh, and, and violations of the nuisance property bylaw. So I thought this was troubling um, especially the way it's worded, you know, just to be found in violation of, of the section, not necessarily even being deemed a nuisance property. And, you know, all the things that we had built out before that were pretty much undone uh, through the discussions. Um, and, you know, I just didn't, I just didn't think it would work well um, that, that we would have to put a property if found in violation into an annual inspection program. Um, in fact, there might be, plenty of situations, um, depending on how the police department enforces 3.26, uh, there might be plenty of situations where we don't do any inspection at all. Uh, so man didn't, you know, making it a required inspection just didn't seem right to me anymore. I'm, I'm, uh, I, let's get this back in. Did we just lose Pam? Oh, no, there she is. Yeah. Well, you're no, she's on. Oh, she can't get the mute off. You're here, but you're muted. Pam. Here. Sorry about that. I just it just blanked out. <laughs> I think my my Wi-Fi cut off. Okay. Sorry about that. I think I got the gist of what Rob said. And then he froze, or I froze. So, so um, any other conversation? Mandy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I actually did because, you know, I, I actually, even more after what Rob said, like this, because we actually wrote this as maybe subject to. So, so if they're found in violation, the code, principal code official could put them on a more frequent schedule than the five years, but they don't have to. But if it was, may be subject to, but not less than annually, it would either be a choice of every five years or at least once a year, even if the violation from nuisance property didn't necessarily go to a health and safety concern, say. Um, and so by removing that, but not less than annually, um, with the may, I, I almost feel from a legislative point of view that it makes it more likely that this section could be used or would be used and implemented by our code officials because they can choose two, three, 
one and a half um, if they want that instead of having to choose one or five, which is how it was written before with that phrase. So I actually like the removal even better for that reason that I think we'll actually get more benefit from it. Thank you. Any other comments, any other thoughts? Let's make a motion. I can make a motion to, oh, we have another one. We have another regulation. Yeah. Let's go to B1A1. That can't be right. Rob? So oh, this is proposed to be a new section. Uh, and I and I thought it would be clearer just to keep it separate on its own uh, to deal with the phasing in following the initial bylaw adoption. Uh, so as that, you know, five, six years from now, it's we either strike it from the language or just ignore it uh, because it wouldn't be applicable anymore. And we would go to the uh, the first provision for inspections every five years. So, so my language, and you know, feel free to modify it, but the, the, the intent there was to just establish that um, what we talked about earlier is that that first year is going to be a slow start and it's really year two of six where we really start doing uh, the bulk of the inspections and uh, with a goal of getting to 2030 to complete the first round, I thought it was worth being clear to uh, landlords and managers and owners that, you know, unless they're on some other special inspection program because of uh, violations or problems, the second inspection is not going to incur, uh, not going to occur until uh, after July 1st, 2030. Uh, so those first hundred units in year one uh, will, will um, you know, both be the the ones that get to go first and see how, how things happen and also the benefit of possibly an extra year waiting for renewal. Uh, so that that's the way I was uh, suggesting we approach it. Jennifer. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think, I think that's anything we can do to for clarity and it is a good thing. So I think um, that's great. <laughs> That as, as much as there can be less confusion and to show that it's, you know, really not so onerous, I think is a benefit. Yeah, I, I just have a couple of requested changes. Um, since adoption and effective dates are different, I would change all references of adoption to references to effective date because there's a 14 day difference in there and you can't actually begin enforcing until it's effective. Um, so I would say begin immediately following the effective date of the bylaw like this and continue to be phased in during the year following the effective date instead of initial adoption um, like this. And then the other thing, the other one, I, I, I'm i not sure this last phrase and this section deleted from the regulations needs to be in here. <laughs> uh, so I would just delete that just because I don't think it needs to be there. It could be deleted earlier, in fact, um, but it's not, I don't think that's a self sort of self-executing deleting of that section on July 1, 2030 by that language. And so I figure we might as well just delete it since it's not necessary. So I would do that. Any comments about that? Rob? Rob, did you want to respond to that? Yes, um, uh, Mandy, just if, if it matters, um, and I, I think those are both 
two good suggestions. Uh, back at the bylaw language, it does say upon adoption of the bylaw. So I was just being consistent. Uh, if if it matters to say effective, if you want to go back to the bylaw and revise that to be upon effective date of the bylaw. Um, That makes sense. Uh, Councillor Ette. Um, this is just a question regarding clarity. Um, the first round, does that refer to inspections that are made within the first year in the sense that if there is this five or six year window, does that mean that each year counts as one round? What what exactly is the limit, the time limit of a round? Rob, do you want to answer that? Or Mandy, go ahead. Oh no, I wasn't going to answer that. I was going to respond to Rob's and and think about think out loud about the use of the word adoption versus effective date. Okay. Rob, would you like to respond to so yeah when we refer to a round, you know, we're talking about all of the units in the program being inspected the first time. So that's over the full duration of the five or six years uh, to all the way through 2030. So um, although they might start immediately um, and, and continue to be phased in, it's, it's really getting through all of the uh, 24, 2,500 units that are listed in that, uh, that detailed fee schedule. Did that, did that answer the question? Yes, it did. Thank okay. you. Mandy. So adoption versus effective date, right? Um, the bylaw says, and may, maybe we can change one here in the regulations. Um, the bylaw says, and provisions for phasing in this inspection requirement upon adoption of the bylaw. I think that's the correct use of adoption versus effective date um because the regulations adoption is when you voted to do it and the regulations will say how are we going to phase it in once we know it's a law even if the effective date is two weeks two months down the line so i'm not sure i'd recommend changing the bylaw in that sense i think what concerned me was uh the the inspections may begin immediately following, you said, adoption of the bylaw, but they can't actually begin immediately following adoption because the bylaw is not actually effective for two weeks. So you've got that two week period where you're still in the old system. So how do you do inspections under this one when this one's not actually legally in effect yet? So I think this this first one needs to be effective date, but then reading this other one and continue to be phased in during the year following, I think that one could be adoption. I'm, I'm, I think that could be either way. Because um, essentially the issue is there's two different dates we're dealing with and you can't do anything legally under this bylaw until the effective date, but you can talk about adoption, which is two weeks earlier. I would agree so with that. Changing the second one back to adoption. It seems like adoption is sort of the generic term of of it being enacted, and yeah. rather specific as you as you pointed out with the effective date. I think that's that's fine. And I also agree that it we wouldn't have to change the re the bylaw accordingly because it's really talking about generically adopting something. Rob, comfortable with this? Does it accomplish what you need? Yes, sounds good. I saw the, I saw the thumbs up. I took that as a yes. <laughs> okay. Um, there was one something that caught my eye. If we could scroll down just a little bit, and I'm not I'm not intending to rewrite this document, please. But um, Number four, just above the, the number two, it says change of ownership within six months of a change of ownership, residential property shall be inspected. Can somebody remind me if if this applies to new, newly created 
uh, rental units as well, or is it just a rental, an existing permitted rental unit that changes hands? So I read that as an existing unit that has a permit that changes hands, but already has a rental permit because something that is newly created would need to apply for a rental permit. And in theory, once this program's going on, would need to be inspected before that permit gets issued. So this is sort of one of those long-term ones that it's been five years or four and a half and they're not up or three years and it's changing owners, it's going to get inspected. Okay. Good. Thank you. Any comments about the changes that were recommend that were suggested and that have been blocked out here in this conversation? I'm looking at Pat, you haven't said much. Just want to make sure you're on board. I'm not hearing any comments, so I'm going to ask for a motion to um, accept these changes. So I'll this one's not going to be as artfully worded. I'll move to recommend um, to, to revise our recommendation to include the amendments made on March at March 12th CRC meeting. Second. Thank you. I'm jotting it down. <laughs> it's like Stating the, it was easier to state what that amendment was the last time <laughs> than these. So effectively, it is it's um, revi revising our our document um, to include the changes made on on tonight tonight's night. Tonight's yeah, and I will send both of those new documents out. Thank you. Um, so let's go back to the conversation about just sort of the implementation, if we could, and um, just- We have to vote. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, all those in favor, um, let's go around the room. Pat D'Angelo. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. And Pam Rooney is an aye, so we have unanimous unanimously accepted the recommended changes and thank Rob for suggesting those. Cleaner is better, step by step. Um, so I will be, hopefully, if I'm going to write to Athena and just double check that I can get on the agenda tomorrow as well, be part of the, the agenda setting meeting. Um, to try as much as possible to get this to the council for, if it's decided that it needs a, a first reading and a second reading, would try to get the first reading for April 1, the second reading for April 8, if that gives it enough time, or if there somehow has to be a two-week period in between, I don't know. Um, no. There doesn't have to be two weeks in between. The bylaw needs posted on the bulletin board for two weeks prior to the vote. Um, the current unrevised one might still be on the bulletin board from the first reading in like November. Um, Athena might know so that it might already be there. Um, but if it's not, or she wants to post the revised one that we're recommending, that would just need posted by the 25th of March for Mar an April 8th vote. Okay, so that's um, that's a week, two weeks from now, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have revised documents. They have been voted and approved by us. Um, I'm just asking, just to double check, does any of this need to go to GOL? It did go to GOL first and came back to us for some further tweaking. And Mandy. 
Yeah, so it's all been through GOL and we have maintained a record of the changes from that version to what is going back to the council. Um, the referral was to come back to us, not to sort of restart the whole process and send it back to GOL or anything. Uh, obviously, if the council says this is so much we need a GOL review, they can send it back. Um, but you know, my thinking is send it back to the council. They can see what changes we're making and whether they believe versus uh, as a, you know, from the one GOL reviews and reviewed and declared clear, considered and act actionable, and they could make that own determination if they need it or not. Um, but but it's does, that mean, does that mean that we need to make sure that, that the GOL version is in the packet as well as our finished product. So like the tracked changes version we've been looking at is the GOL version with changes. So if we put our tracked version in as well as a clean version, the tracked version shows the difference between what is being asked to be adopted now, our new recommendation and GOL's voted clear, consistent, and actionable one. So all those things in red we just saw show the difference between okay. GOL. So I had I had very carefully and I and we can we can reverse what I did, but I had very carefully accepted all changes and made a nice clean copy and was going to put that in the packet for the council so that they wouldn't be confused by stuff. Yeah, so I will create a clean and a tract. I, I, what I was doing today was off the ones I sent you last week. So they were the voted ones from last time. Um, okay. And I will send those and the clean version along. Great. Um, Great. Okay. And part of the presentation, I guess, could explain why there's a tract change version in the packet, but that the motion is to adopt a fully clean version of that. Yeah. And then before some of you got on this evening, I did ask Mandy Jo about the uh, the wisdom of including the nuisance bylaw that we've already passed as part of the same package. And she suggested that perhaps the nuisance bylaw might be reported on separately just because it is, it's obviously very linked. It's very much connected to the, the topic, but if it ended up for some reason getting handled in a different manner, it wouldn't hold up um, the rental registration by law itself. And that seems to make sense. Andy. I agree. Um, <laughs> I'm shy. Um, but, but I would also urge you tomorrow at agenda setting, at least my thoughts are, to try and get them all on the same agendas, that we shouldn't sit on nuisance, that the urge for this entire package to be on the same agendas. Nuisance will obviously need two readings and it needs to go through GOL yet. I don't know whether it has or not. Um, so okay. it can't go on an agenda till it's out of GOL. Um, so it might not be able to go on the same ones, but it would be, it, if possible, it would be great if it could, but just because it has some extra review that this one might not need at this point, because they were on different tracks to begin with. Um, it might not be possible, but maybe it is possible to get it through GOL before April 1st for a first read for nuisance. I don't know. Okay, we'll give that a try. Any other thoughts on that? Sounds like not. Okay, I think we... I think we have wrapped up the conversation about rental registration and nuisance package. I'll call it the joint package. Um, I am ready to move on to another item on the on the agenda. If any any final questions for Rob, he would be free to go. And with deep felt gratitude for all the hours and patience working with this committee over the last two, count them, two years. Um, it's been a slog, but it's been 
so incredibly helpful to have you walk through this with us because you're you're in that world. You're doing it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> Are we allowed to buy like a bottle of something for staff? <laughs> Dave's going. No. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Uh, next agenda item is uh, approval of uh, March 13, 2024 meeting minutes. February 13. February 13. Two, two <laughs> is not March. Two is February. It would be impressive if we could approve tomorrow's meeting minutes that doesn't happen today. <laughs> Being clairvoyant, of course we can. How about how about February 13 meeting minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the February 13, 2024 meeting minutes as presented. Second, DeAngelis. If no comments, let's go for a vote. Jennifer. Yes. Councilor Ette. Aye. Pat. Aye. Mandy. Aye. Pam. Aye. Unanimously approved, and those will get updated and put in the put in for posting so that the the rest of the world can see them. <laughs> um, I don't have any announcements except the next meeting, which is which is the twenty sixth of March, right? Yep. Um, and then a quick preview of the next agenda items. And and I think I had on here nuisance and rental registration bylaw transmittal to council. And I think that was simply, you know, if if um if we're still in the process of transmitting it and having it um put on the agenda, we'll just do an update on that, make sure that everybody is aware of, of where we stand. Um we do need at some point to talk about planning board vacancies and starting the process for that. We have two potential, we have two people whose term ends and we would want to start preparing for that um, process as well. Um, let's see. The other thing that we talk about, and I think, and I think Dave has mentioned that that um, wants to be part of the conversation, is how to roll out the solar bylaw. And I will let you know that I had a really nice uh, email back from Christine Brestrup, the director of planning, who responded to a, a list that I sent to her, saying these are the these are the categories, all the different topics of the proposed, excuse me, of the draft bylaw. And these are the committees and these are the, the kinds of staff that seem to be appropriate for providing some input to the CRC for those different topics. And she said, great, look forward to working with the CRC. And she would like to make a presentation or at least meet with us on the 26th to begin that conversation of um, the moving parts and the pieces that we need to put together to start building that bylaw. We were given a draft. Obviously, drafts get, get worked on. And I think one of the key components will be um, interaction with the or input from the staff and in, in, input from the various committees in town who have expertise in certain arenas. We would love to tap that, including the planning board. So I think having Chris as sort of the liaison to all this is really important since we'll be working on this bylaw essentially in parallel with the planning board. Any other thoughts? Anything else that should go on the agenda next time? Dave. 
Yeah, thanks for that outline of, of solar bylaw. And I did speak with Chris and I'm gonna meet with the planning staff next week to talk about that outline for the 26th. Um, and, and perhaps you and I, Pam, can talk in the next three or four days about what that might look like. My, my one concern is, you know, having just con, um, thanked Rob for his two years of attending your meetings and all that time, my one concern about solar bylaw is, you know, how many, you know, how many meetings will it be? How many staff will need to come? Having multiple staff come on one night, I just, I, I think we need to kind of outline how to be as efficient as possible because, you know, every one of these staff members has a full plate, and when they attend a night meeting, you know, um, it's it's time consuming for them, their families, and and also may have a ripple effect on on their work day the next day if they flex or or whatever in terms of time. So I just want to be efficient in our process because we know the community is very, the community is also going to want to weigh in, I, I imagine, pretty extensively on this. So um, it's been a while. And Chris is the, the right person to start with on the 26th because she's done so much of the work uh, uh, with the committee writing and feedback and all of that. And, uh, you know, I know Stephanie Ciccarello has been around the table as well, but just trying to figure that out. So maybe you and I can talk, Pam, and, and kind of chart out how that how that could go and, and which staff might come on which nights. Um, yeah. with some predictability. That's all. But it, it's exciting to to have some things moving off your plate and new things coming on. So thank you. Maybe we can do the solar bylaw with two reads, you know, the first read on the 26th and then no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Sure, it's all out. <laughs> thinking, thinking, op thinking, thinking optimistically. We can dream. <laughs> Mandy. Yeah, I I would request that we start, if we're going to start it on the 26th, that we start with a general discussion of hearing thoughts, concerns, anything committee might need, not just from Chris, but from other staff or other places, um, you know, things like that. Um, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I remember my first impression of it was, wow, it needs a lot of work. And my second impression was, hmm, there's a lot of things in here that the AG has said on town bylaws that they won't accept on town bylaws. Ours doesn't, if we adopt something that doesn't go through a town bylaw, but that has said that's not doable. And so I, I'd like to potentially start with just a much more general conversation of where are we going and what are our goals and what does that look like before we get into sort of the nitty gritty. Sounds excellent. It's in line with my thinking. Um, what I will put in the packet for next time is the list uh, that I sent to, to Chris Brestrup and it was simply um, sort of draft bylaw section by section and potentially what input might be needed on those different topics. So I'll put that in the packet. It's just a study guide, if you will, and, and, and to start the conversation going. Jennifer, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I was going to ask along those lines, is it possible, like as soon as you have the study guide or if there's reading material, like I know Pat said, because you had worked on it before, if there's anything that can be put up, you know, this week, whenever, so that the committee can start, you know, have some background, because it's not an area we're all really that familiar with. That would be helpful. Yeah. Thank yep. you. I will, I will put in as much, I mean, a lot of information that would, that'll keep repeating, you know, if you will, but, um, uh, it will at least be it will at least be in our um, in our SharePoint file folder for for the that's, next. That's that's helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? It is ten of eight. Any any pressing business? If not, we could get used to this. Yeah. <laughs> We could we could adjourn. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Thanks. Dave. Uh -huh.
<laughs> Do we have to vote on that or can we just adjourn since there's so much trouble in the world of the council right now? <laughs> I thought that a chair could adjourn at any time. I'm seeing Mandy, but she's muted. <laughs> Sorry, our rules don't indicate anything like that in theory, um, but the business is done and I don't, it, I would word it as without objection. <laughs> and if there's an objection, then you got to vote on it. <laughs> no objection to ending early. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Dave.